from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell at Edgbaston, the venue for the first test in the 2019 Men's Ashes series between England and Australia. The Aussies hold the urn, meaning England need to win the series outright to prize it back from their hands. Looking out across the outfield here, uh, ground staff busying themselves uh, on that biscuit-coloured pitch. Alongside me is the ABC's voice of cricket, Jim Maxwell. Jim, you are in your element here, aren't you? Right in the midst of a thrilling Ashes contest. I feel as emotional as I think um, Steve Smith was when he got to 99 and, and then eventually got out for 144. It was uh, the most extraordinary innings on the most remarkable day of Test cricket. It reminded me in some way, if you look at the scorecard of Australia, almost in 2005. They were eight down and gone and then resuscitated the game to the point where it came down to one ball, one shot being the difference. But uh, it was the most uh, amazing innings I think I've seen Steve play, given the context of uh, where he is coming back and where Australia was uh, when Siddle came out to partner him in that excellent partnership. So uh, uh, an extraordinary day, one of the great days of Test cricket, no doubt. Charu, we're sorry that you can't be part of the Ashes party over here with us. Where are you this week? Charu Sharma, hello. Well, you could sound a little more sorry than that, Alison. <laughs> I'm but sorry. But yes, I certainly, I certainly wish I could be there with you, considering all the drama and the heroics of the Ashes. But, you know, happy enough to join you guys for the World Cup earlier on. I'm in Delhi again, Alison, Jim, deep into the Ultimate Table Tennis League, featuring some of the top players from around the world. So, you know, it's always magical seeing any sport at the highest level, and it's always an education. But but, uh, yeah, I, I, I wonder if I can compete with the drama of the Ashes for the moment. Well, look, there are a few cricketing talking points in India, Charon. We're going to come on to those uh, just in a short while. But we have to start with the Ashes. Many felt that the oldest rivalry in cricket might take a back seat this English summer because it was coming so soon after the World Cup. But if the opening days play is anything to go by, it's going to be quite the thrill ride. And we're ready to go, the start of the 2019 Ashes. Here we are with Anderson coming in and bowling to Bancroft who allows that to go through outside the old stump. A little bit of movement away. He's nicked it. Warner could have been out first Ooh. ball. Broad, round the wicket, on his way. Bowls to David Warner, who's hit on the pad. Appeal goes out. Warner's out. Bancroft facing up to Broad again. Three slips in the short leg. Broad edges, and it's taken. He's got it, got the edge. He's got the edge. He is wokes. He bowls. He hits him on the pad. The Bill Brown, we love you. Out. Anderson, tightness in the calf. And he's going for a scan this afternoon. And out. Caught a deep square leg. Broad is ecstatic. That's another run. It's the 200 for Australia. And Broad's on his way again. Bowls to the left handed Pattinson. He's there. And he's hit on the pad. Appeals to the leg before we get up. Goes the finger. In comes Stokes. He's there. He bowls to him. He drives through the covers. And there you go. Steve Smith in his return test match has scored his 24th and, I'm sure for him, his most important test century. Well, there is Jonathan Agnew describing an incredible century for Steve Smith in his first test innings since the ball tampering scandal, which cost him the Australian captaincy. He scored 144 to rescue Australia from that perilous 122 for eight to 284 all out. And Jim, you've already spoken about it. And I, I thought it showed incredible resilience and determination. And yeah, he remarked afterwards, didn't he, that he'd never felt as nervous batting in the 90s as he did when he was looking to get to that three figures. And it's, it's resonated, this innings, hasn't it? It has, and it's reminded all of us uh, how well this man can play. There was a wonderful stat along the lines that uh, on the first day of a test match, Steve Smith is unsurpassed. He's averaging 116 when he bats on the first day of a test. I mean, that's Bradman-esque, really. And uh, uh, the way he's scoring these runs, particularly in Ashes cricket, he's almost 1,000 runs in his last six tests. So it, it's a continuation, as it were, of that run of success he, he had at home, given that he's had more than a year out of the game. So normal service resumed for Australia. And uh, 
alas, when you look at the rest of the batting, uh, he stands as just head, shoulders and the rest of it away from what was a pretty mediocre effort from the top order uh, against some excellent bowling, it must be said, from an undermanned England attack. So that's why it all added up to such a gripping day of cricket. Uh, so we are, are seeing the manifestation of probably one of the great batsmen of the game continuing to, to add to his illustrious career and in, in this uh, most emotional comeback. Uh, it was a, a, an extraordinary performance and given that uh, there was a slightly partisan crowd there, it was uh, even more impressive because of it. And I love the way when he got out at the end, he rushed off the field as if to get away from any potential uh, derogatory uh, remarks or cheering, jeering from the crowd. So, uh, yeah, that, that was fascinating to watch as he left the field after his great innings. Charu, Steve Smith, a popular figure in India. He'd, of course, played in the Indian Premier League before making his test comeback. But I suppose that it, it's, this shows really just how much test cricket means and the, the elevation of his achievement here sort of above all others. Well, in India, when he came back for the IPL, I must confess that David Warner perhaps stole the limelight and Steve was a little quieter, but more under the radar, which maybe suited him. But you mentioned just a while back that in the 90s, you've never seen him more jumpy and nervous now. That must have been a sight because he's ordinarily all jumpy, and nervous looking anyway. Extraordinary innings, without doubt, and very popular figure in India. Yeah, the atmosphere at Edgbaston was, I think, the most febrile that I've heard it, which is saying something when David Warner and Bancroft came out, when Warner was dismissed in particular. Even when Smith came out to bat, Jim, there was still the boos. When he reached his hundred, some boos. When he walked off the field, still some boos. He says it doesn't bother him. And he he's scoring runs. And that you imagine be the way to quieten the crowd down. But your commentary was sort of quite perfect in a way just saying this guy's just scored the most remarkable hundred it is not fair to boo him now uh, yes i think they need to show more respect uh, and this is sport after all and okay you pay your money you can do what you like i suppose whatever event you go to but uh, i thought uh, for those that were booing and not everyone was that there were a number of people standing and applauding as well they might because they had seen one of the greatest innings in the history of test cricket and uh, it's interesting to contemplate uh, the whole Steve Smith story because it's not that long ago with his elbow injury that he even contemplated giving the, away, the game away completely. Yeah. And Steve Smith has shown, Charu, remorse. He showed remorse at the time. I don't think anybody questioned whether those tears were genuine as somebody who lives and breathes cricket in, in the way that he did. It was, it was a, a, a stupendous fall from grace and an equally incredible rise now. Well, yes, I, yeah, there's no doubt that, you know, what adds to the fact is that he showed remorse because every once in a while people can be a little arrogant about their mistakes and that can exacerbate the situation and people tend not to forgive. But in his case, of course, we know that he's a wonderful, uh, you know, individual as well. A little quirky, but wonderful. And uh, I'd like to just broaden this by saying that anyone making an error anytime, you've got to be forgiving, uh, especially if one has done one's time. And, and he and Warner and Bancroft certainly did. So, uh, it, I mean, we can talk about uh, forgiveness as much as we like, but there will be fans out there who will try and remember this as long as possible and utilize it to their advantage in terms of heckling. But I, I, I do think that sportsmen generally have more resilience. You talked about that earlier, resilience. And uh, maybe Steve Smith and Warner can get over that reducing criticism because it will reduce as we go along uh, easily because they are top level sports persons you can't possibly let you know a section of the audience or whatever heckle you and, and, and let it get to your mind because I mean a lot of people this has been said so often when you enter the white line the white line fever and you enter the ground or, or any kind of contest arena uh, then you you have to forget what's going on on the outside and uh, Steve Smith showed that he can from the BBC World Service, this is Stumped on All India Radio. To India now and two stories that have made the headlines this week. First up, reports of a rift between the captain Virat Kohli and vice-captain Rohit Sharma. Now, Indian media have been all over this, with the pair said to have clashed in the aftermath of India's World Cup semi-final exit. According to the Hindustan Times, the Board of Control for Cricket of India had to intervene to, quote, douse the fire. Charu, tell us a little bit more about this. There's never any hyperbole in the Indian media, is there? I mean, why is there said to be tension between the two? 
Oh, they love the possibility of a controversy because, you know, just plain reporting a, a test match score or whatever is just hopeless. It's all about controversy. And I'm not saying this is completely, you know, sort of false. I mean, well, Virat Kohli uh, on his, before his departure to the West Indies was very clear. There is no rift. We're good friends and so on and so forth. And if there's a difference of opinion, and that can't be misconstrued to be a rift. Well, there, there are differences of opinion. They can happen anywhere, inside the field, outside the field. And that's good because every once in a while we need more opinion to be able to get to the best option. So, you know, there's a complete denial on the part of the players, which is not new. Of course, these rifts have been, so-called rifts have been talked about for just about every generation of players in India. The media picks up on something. Why would there have been the possibility? Only because there was some question on Virat Kohli's captaincy. Uh, which also may be unfounded, where well, India lost in the semis. It was a close match and they really should have won. And Rohit Sharma's captaincy for the Mumbai Indians, which has won them many titles, and Virat Kohli's captaincy for the Bangalore team in, uh, in the IPL, which hasn't won him any title at all. But I think that's a you know chalk and cheese situation. T20s, you never know what's going on. And of course, it depends on the personnel you have. So it's really perhaps about captaincy because Rohit Sharma has very often been anointed the vice captain and there were people who, who might have wanted him to be a captain. And of course, he had a wonderful run during the World Cup as well, except for that final, uh, the, the semi-final. So it's just conjecture. I mean, from whatever I can read uh, about this, the players themselves almost never really get to be public enemies or, or take the enemy out in public. And, uh, you know, the big thing about the Indian team, which Virat Kohli kept on and on about and the rest of the players as well, including Dhoni, is the fact that they are so together, more together than any time in history. So where does a rift come into all of this? Well, let's have a listen to what Kohli himself has had to say about it all. Here he is speaking before the squad's departure for their tour of the West Indies. In my opinion, it's baffling, to be honest. It's absolutely ridiculous to read such stuff that comes out you know bringing p personal lives into the picture it's it's disrespectful after a moment honestly i've always praised rohit whenever i've had an opportunity because i believe he is that good we have had no issues oh chari what's this going to do for Kohli's relationship with the media and vice versa well, I must say, over the years, he has softened a bit. And in the past, he was, you know, seen to be, well, prickly, arrogant. But he has softened, no question about that. And, and I wonder if the marriage has anything to do with this or whatever, you know, as people speculate. But I really think this Indian unit is, is very together. And there are some brilliant individuals. They tend to be playing more for the country. Rohit Sharma has come out with a statement or two. I'm, I'm not being able to quote this exactly, saying that, Every time I go out there is not just for me, it's for the team, it's for the country. So there's a lot of togetherness, no question about it. I think the media will kind of pursue it for another, you know, few couple of weeks or so and then give up on it because there will be no more in terms of this rift. Only when they retire, there will be some hint here and there about the fact that, oh, there was that time when we were supposed to be having a rift. Well, we had a difference of opinion, but it was nothing really. So, you know, nothing's going to come out of this. That's for sure. Well, the other big story in India is the news that India's 19-year-old test opener, Prithvi Shaw, has been suspended from cricket until November after testing positive for a banned substance that's commonly found in cough syrups, I understand. Uh, he's accepted his eight-month ban, which has been backdated to March of this year. So how has that news gone down, Cherry? Well, it's certainly created a bit of a furore here. Not because he ingested what, terbutaline or whatever it's called in cough syrup, and it's certainly not a performance enhancer. And, uh, of course, to take Prithvi Shaw's side, he did admit that he took some cough syrup and he was very, very regretful that he didn't consult his doctors taking an over-the-counter cough syrup, you know, for something that uh, back in February, March or whenever. And, and he accepts completely. So he's not denying this. He's not playing innocent, you know, a victim here. He's saying, yes, I took some and I should have been wiser. Uh, I mean, I may not be the oldest cricketer around, but I know enough about the fact that I should not be taking anything uh, without consulting a doctor. So it's just a question of dates here. It's a chronological matter where when did he take it? When was it discovered? Why was it discovered so late? Why wasn't he banned earlier? So those are the issues that are floating around in India now. And why was he allowed to continue playing the IPL when the new, perhaps beforehand or sometime during the IPL? And also the Mumbai T20 League, which I was commentating on, he was very much a part of it and got injured again, but they got to the title. So, you know, it's injury management. It's just one of those things where it's not like a major performance enhancing matter, but he has admitted to taking something and he's happy to pay the penalty. I just hope once again that he comes out of it, uh, you know, without any scarring.
<laughs> Cough syrup Jim. up here, please. Some for you, Jarrow, as well. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> Jim, is this, is this more, you think, naivety on Pritby Shaw's part? I mean, when you're a, a professional athlete, you, you have to know that you, you run everything by your doctors these days with, when, when it comes to medicines. Well, how often have we seen athletes do something like this? And yes, OK, we all make mistakes, even umpires, even players. Uh, so uh, it sounds like it's all a, a, a bit of a, a, a blow up beat up I just uh, hope that he gets the right syrup as it were uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, I hope from you, now on. and I hope you do too Jared <laughs> yeah, 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 right here right now We're but let me quickly add over. though Go sorry Elsa. let me quickly add though that uh, you know this uh, um, opens up a wider matter the, the refusal of the Indian cricket board to accept WADA and it's a uh, yes, national this is more component serious, isn't matter. It? Correct. Because they've been staying away from it very long. Only recently has there been a bit of a thaw, and there's some sort of a test process that NADA, which is a national anti-doping agency, is allowed to get into cricket. Because so far they've been having this test done by some relatively less authorised uh, uh, agency. So I think the Supreme Court or the Indian government or whoever has also stepped in now saying, excuse me, you get under NADA and therefore WADA, and let's just have a more legitimate process because it's all very well structured there. There's no ambiguity or subjectivity. You know, this happens and then that will happen and this is the cause of the consequence and so on and so forth. So I really think the cricket world, if it wants to be considered a major, global, international, fully accepted sport, needs to be completely under WADA and NADA because the cricket is not born on some other planet. I mean, if the tennis players or any other major golf star, whoever they are, are also happy to be tested regularly under WADA conditions, why not cricketers? So if cricket's ever going to get into the Olympic Games, uh, India are going to have to lift their game because it won't happen unless they're subject to the rules and regulations of the IOC. There you go. Yep, fully agree. Well, that's all for this week's Stumped on All India Radio. You can follow us on Twitter at BBC WS Sport. And use the hashtag BBC Stumped. My thanks to Chari Sharma and Jim Maxwell and to you for listening. Join us again next time. Bye-bye. Stumped is a BBC Sport production for the BBC World Service in association with the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and All India Radio.